It's good to see you this morning. Uh, glad you're here with us. If you're watching on YouTube or other places, we're glad you uh, took uh, taking time out to watch us as well this week. I forgot to mention one name during uh, the prayer time this morning. Uh, Becky Wisnett, continue to pray for her and Bruce and the family, if you would, please. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we just thank you for a wonderful, beautiful day. A day that you and your wisdom set aside to worship. Not to worship nature. Not to worship family. But to worship you. And God, I pray that that, that is our longing, that is our desire, that is our wish for being here today. That we want to focus on you on your mighty power and your wisdom and your mercy and your grace, for your provision, for your long-suffering, for your kindness, for all those things that tell us about you and that we've experienced for ourselves. God, please, in a glorious way, meet with us today. Lord, you heard all the different prayer requests earlier. And God, we just pray that you and your marvelous, gracious hand work in those circumstances and those cir uh, situations the way that would bring the most honor and the most glory to you. God, if it's healing, we're going to rejoice and give praise. God, if it is not healing, God, we're going to rejoice and give praise as well because you have taken care of that for us and we don't have to fear the end of this life because we know through faith there is a better world ahead. And I just pray, God, that grace will be sufficient to get each person to the place that you have designed for them. And, God, that you would move in their lives, do according to uh, those things that are pleasing uh, to you. We pray for our nation. We pray for its leadership. We pray for uh, an, a spiritual awakening in our land. God, help us, we cry. Amen. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Remain seated as we sing hymn 153, Worthy of Worship.
let's sing now 329 there's power in the blood <coughs> said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. This song, uh, I had a, a great PowerPoint presentation. You can see the words and sing along with us. And I wasn't prepared to try to sing off these sheets this morning. But it's a great song, and I want the church to learn this going forward. It's called, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. And if the computer will cooperate, we'll sing this this morning. The gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. No more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is holy. To his. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark. 
forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend. shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Your fate I tread, I know I am forgiven, the future sure been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever will my plea chains are released I can sing I am free yet not I but the Christ in me with every breath I long to follow Jesus that he said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory in this life and, and we think about how awful things really can be Lord we often forget the power that is within us when that Holy Spirit comes and, and resides in us we thank you Lord God for the gift of your Holy Spirit and for the power that it brings to each and every one of us guide us this day Lord and for the remainder of this service I pray, Lord, for open hearts and minds to receive all that you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, if you'll find your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Psalm number 85. Psalm number 85. Uh, if you were here last week or uh, watched it, uh, the message itself wasn't about uh, backsliding, but it was uh, about uh, not, not staying true and going away from the principles and precepts of the gospel and those, uh, those types of things. <clears throat> Unless you've been under a rock, for the last 16 months or so, uh, we have been in a pandemic around the world, but here in the United States. And for many of those months, the government encouraged churches to do what? Shut down, not to have services. And there's been legal battles, and I'm not here to discuss that. But what's happened as a result, and as I listen to preachers talk, One of their biggest concerns is, are the people going to come back? Because they've been away and, bless their hearts, we got comfortable watching church in our PJs with a cup of coffee and a donut in one hand and saying, Amen, preacher, keep on. And they're, they're concerned that the church will never be the same. Well, the message today and the one next week, uh, there's but one way to to stop that trend and bring it back the other way. And it's what the church calls revival. As you are seated here or watching, don't worry about anybody else. If I had my way, I I would want to take this message or this lesson and sit down in a room with each individual and do it one at a time. That way you can't say they need it. Boy, preach it to them, preacher. They really need it. What I'm going to ask you to do is to look at yourself and with each each thought, each point, each whatever we discuss today, will you truly say yes or no? Your answers, if you're truthful, will determine where you fall on that spiritual barometer between hot and cold. The psalmist asks, Lord, will you not revive us again? And the reason for revival is in the second half of the verse is that your people may re." I present to you our church and other churches, many churches, and I might even dare say all churches have lost their joy. Well, it's hard to tell anymore. I can't tell people smiling or not behind the mask. But I don't seem to sense a joyful spirit in people anymore. They're always worried, always concerned about something, whether it's the virus or some other issues that's going on in life. Listen, we as believers, we have a source of joy that's outside of that. And it shouldn't have any bearing in our life. No matter what circumstances or situations may arise in our life. So let's read the verse. I think I quoted it correctly. We'll read it to make sure. Psalm 85, verse 6. Will thou not revive us again? that thy people may rejoice in thee. Now by implication, something needs to happen. Now in context, he's talking about the nation of Israel and the nation's uh, uh, relationship to God. Now if you know the Old Testament, Israel was prone to go away and start serving idols and all kinds of things like that. But during the... Uh, reign of King David, they never went towards idolatry. They just went away towards just everyday religious stuff. I'm going to ask you the question. Now listen, before I ask you these questions, I ask myself these questions, and I'm going to be honest, I didn't like some of the answers I got. 
Well, preacher, surely you could always give the affirmative answer on everything. I can't. I'm just like you. We all are are prone in the same things in our Christian life. And because of our absence from each other, because we spent time away from each other, the closeness and unity that may have been there may not be there anymore in anything. But I'm talking specifically today about our relationship with God and the fervency in that relationship. Do I, the preacher of Baton Baptist Church, need a revival? Do you want my answer? I'll tell you up front, yes. Yes. Well, preacher, why do you need revival? Because the flame gets cool every once in a while. Don't mean I do anything wrong or do stuff. But the, the desire and the fire and the passion may dwindle on occasions. Now listen to these just words. I know that I need something. Now the something is revival. That's what the lesson's about. How do I know that I need reviving? How do I know that the furnace needs to be turned up in my spiritual life that I might be where I need to be and maybe was once there? Shackled by a heavy burden. We just, Miss Parker just played the song. But something happened one day. You remember what that was? He touched me. And it says, and I was never the same anymore. We have something because of what he's did for us. But because we're human and because we're prone to go away from that, these things happen. If you, if I, if we have spiritual deadness and formalism above passion. Well, preacher, what do you mean by that? Is your spiritual life becoming routine? Do you do the same thing every single day You read the same amount, you pray about the same things, you go about the same activities that you do every single day without any variation. You need a revival. We can get stale, even in religious activities, if they do not remain fresh and vibrant in our lives. And we can become spiritually dead. I'm not talking about being lost. I'm talking about losing the fire and the passion of our salvation if we just go about the everyday. Now, do not answer this in that loud. If Miss Parker lets me live the next year, we'll be married 50 years. We ain't in the honeymoon phase anymore. You remember way back when? But now if you ask me, I say I love her more now than I did 49 years ago when I married. Preacher, how is that possible? You can be in love with somebody but still not have the same fire and passion that you had when you first began the journey. And the same thing is true spiritually. When he touched us that first time, if you were truly touched by God, the fire of the Holy Spirit come upon you and you were a different person living a different way, wanting a different pattern in life. Amen, preacher. But as it's cooled off, you need to be revived. i got to hurry or I won't get done in an hour and a half. Amen. Have you become ap- apathetic? and lazy about spiritual things? Is it getting easier for you not to pick up the Bible every day? Well, preacher, you just fussed. That's for picking it up every day. But once you start failing to pick it up, once you begin to neglect the things of the Bible, 
And we'll talk about those things as we go through. The fire will go out. And you'll lose the heat that should be there to keep us going in the same intensity in our life. You don't have to raise your hand or say anything. How many of us do not have enough time each day to read our Bible? But how many of us would say, Preacher, I just didn't have time this week to read. Did you have time to sleep? Did you have time to eat? Did you have time to go to work? Ecclesiastes, for everything, there is a time. It's just whether you're willing to set aside some time. But once we become lazy towards the spiritual things of God, they will cool off. Have you begun to compromise with worldly things? You can't be hot for God and in love with the world at the same time. It's an impossibility. If your thought processes are towards the things of the world and the attitudes and the philosophies of the world and not towards God, you need reviving. Well, preacher, none of us are there. Yes, you are. I listen. I hear. I hear church people who are thinking contrary to scriptures. They're thinking and saying and voicing the things that the world says is acceptable and says it's okay instead of what God says. You need, I need, we need reviving. Are you living just for stuff? Is things, money, occupation, whatever it may be, is that more important to you than the things of God? You, I, we need reviving. I'm going to give you three little pictures. If this describes you, if you're looking at your life, how do I know in the middle of July that my garden needs a little water? All I have to do is look at it. When the ground is dry and cracking and the plants are wilting, preacher, give me something to drink. Now, it's either got to come from two places. It's either got to come from me or God. And if God doesn't send the rain and if I want healthy plants, guess what I got to do? I got to drag the water hose out, set up the sprinkler, do whatever I'm going to do to give the earth some relief. If I look at my life and I don't see a vibrant, healthy life, it needs something. It is the water of God's Word. It is the freshness of the Holy Spirit. It needs something to bring it back to life that it can produce fruit. Now, it is a thing of today, and most of us have been down to, uh, to Clay's place down in the woods where he has the fire pit and all that stuff. Fire's roaring. And the longer we sit there, the more it gets to going out. And then before long, all you see is some ashes. Now there's still some fire in there, but it is hid by the cool of the outside. And what you need to do then is to do what? Stir it up and put some more wood on it. Maybe your life is like that fire. You don't see any heat. All you see is the the coolness of the things of God and there's no vibrancy or life to it. He says you need reviving. Reviving is nothing more than stirring the fire and adding fuel to it. Oh, preacher. Am I examining? Will you examine our life? What do you see? You you live with you every day. You may fool the preacher. You all look good to me. Some of you even look like you had a bath. Amen. I don't know how I say foolishness like that. I'm not going to tell you what I just saw. Amen. 
Messi. Well, preacher, what is involved in adding water, stirring up the fire? Preacher, tell me what that looks like. That revival can begin in my life. That I will become the light, the soft, the witness that I need to be for the God that touched me and saved me. Some five things. Will you listen? In order for the spiritual fire to be rekindled in me, I have to become earnestly uh, attentive to the things of God, to the Word of God. To stir it up, I have to begin to practice the things that I know to do. Oh, preacher. But see, that's our instructions in God's Word. It says to be a doer of the Word and not a hearer of the Word. I promise you, as you begin to do the things that the Scripture tells you to do, the fire will get hotter. When you begin to do the things that God tells you to do, how He tells you to do it, and when He tells you to do it, the fire will return. But as long as you can remain a hearer and not a doer, the fire will not get rekindled. Oh, preacher. I, I, I had saw it this week, but Bud mentioned it to me this morning. And uh, I won't give much details, but there's a lady, a religious lady, had written a, a prayer, a prayer that she was reading for everybody. And in that prayer, she said, God, give me a great desire to hate white people. I'm going to tell her she is a hearer of the word and not a doer. My Bible says that I'm to love even my enemies. When we get to doing what it tells us to do, the fire will come back. Are you listening this morning? Number two, to have an excitement and enthusiasm about the things of God. You can't wait to get up and get the Bible open. Now, whether you're a morning person, get up and do it earlier. Whether you're a late night person, it doesn't make any difference to me. Bud, bless his heart, he tries to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Steve Parker says, God's not even up then. Eh? Bless Dr. Steve. Because he likes to sleep late his way through it. Listen, now listen. I'm in the same boat that you all are in. I'm not perfect in these things. But how excited are we Whatever time of the day it is, in the morning or in the moon, uh, midday or the evening, whenever it is, are you excited to pick up the Word of God, uh, the daily bread or whatever uh, devotional thing? Are you excited to pick it up to see what God has to say to us? And I'm going to tell you what the answer is more times than not. We do it because we feel guilty if we don't do it. What I'm encouraging us today is get excited about the things of God. Whatever the things of God is, whether it's prayer or Bible study or or witnessing or doing whatever it is that He wants us to be doing, get excited about it. I have yet met a grandparent that wasn't excited about one thing. Grandkids. I have yet to meet one great-grandparent that wasn't excited about two things. Grandkids and great-grandkids. Am I excited about what God wants to do and am I excited enough to join Him in that? When I get excited, and I'm not talking about emotional. Bud can work us up to be emotional through the songs, but they don't put any heat in us. But when we get excited on the inside that I want to do and I desire to do and I long to do the things of God, I promise you the heat will come back in our spiritual lives.
James 1.22 says, Whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Do we even think about what we're doing as to bring glory to God? Now, you'll put your fingers in the ears and you want to listen to the next one. But we need to become cheerful and active in witnessing and trying to win people to Christ. Now, he's in the saving business. That's his job. Ours is just to tell them. How can they hear unless somebody? I don't ask you to answer the question except to yourself. When is the last time you ever mentioned the gospel to anybody. I promise you, if you become joyful and cheerful in laboring to win souls, I promise you the fire will come back. And that may be the greatest way to get the fire back because that will stir up all these other things. Have we dedicated ourselves totally and completely to God and want Him to be glorified in everything that we say and do? Now, preacher, that sounds wonderful. But now listen and listen carefully. It is impossible to do. Well, preacher, you just told us we need to do it. It's impossible. It's impossible for us to do the things that can rekindle the fire within us. As we do those things, the fire will be rekindled, but we don't have it within us to do it. Well, yes, we do, preacher. Then why pray for it? We've got to realize if I'm going to get to where I need to be, God has to do something. My life is what it is because we've been doing what we do. Prayer is us recognizing, God, if I'm going to be revived, if the heat and the fire of my spiritual life is going to come back, if I'm going to become interested in your work, doing the things that you told me to do, witnessing to people, God, I need your help. It's, it's impossible for the churches in the United States of America to bring revival. It's impossible for our nation to be revived. It's impossible for you to be revived without God's help. Look at what he says. God. God. Will you not revive us again? Will you not do it? The psalmist recognized that if revival, if that refreshing or the renewing, the reactivity to the things of God is to come, it has to start with God. It is through His grace and through His power and through His might the fire can be rekindled. I don't have enough wood to put on the fire to get my fire kindled again. But one breath of the Holy Spirit. And the fire can start again. God, will you blow upon those cold embers of my life? Will you blow? Will you take that sweet Holy Spirit and stir me once again? He wants to. Well, preacher, why don't he do it? Because he desires for you to want it. And until you want it, until I want it, until I desire it, he will not. But the minute I cry out in faith, believing and trusting Him to rekindle the fire and say, God, please do it again, at that point He can do it. It's up to us. God's will and the way that He wants to do it is through prayer. We read in the uh, New Testament, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Do you want the fire stirred enough, up enough to pray?
Do you feel the need enough to pray? Is the spiritual life so dry and so cold that you are longing for something different to happen in your life, that your spiritual life can be different towards God and towards the world and towards the church and towards everybody else, that you want God to do something? Then cry out to God. God, only you can change this. Now we can try to change it. Well, preacher, in the morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to pick my Bible up and I'm going to read and read and read. But I promise you, it'll grow cold. But once the fire is there, once the fire begins to burn and blaze hot again, it won't be a problem. Well, preacher, I don't know about that. What did Moses do? When the people were murmuring and complaining about God and the things of God, what did Moses do? He prayed. When the walls of Jerusalem were torn down and they needed to be rebuilt, what did Nehemiah do? He wept, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. And I can talk about Ezra. All the apostles and many people in the church age, of all ages, young and old, when they needed a work and a, 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 of God to happen in their life, they went to Him for the work to take place. Let me ask you a question. Is the end result worth doing that? Is it worth going through those things to humble ourselves before God and pray and turn from our wicked ways and repent of our sins and do all things that's necessary? Is it worth it? Do you want to rejoice in the Lord again? Do you want to be able to give Him and praise and glory for all things and on all occasions? Then it is worthy. You might want to put your fingers in your ears. Wouldn't it be better to come to church and not worry about trying to find fault with somebody else in the church? Wouldn't it be wonderful not to murmur and complain about every little thing that takes place? Wouldn't it be a joy just to to come to church and not find fault and be dreary and miserable while you're here? Wouldn't you like to have some rejoicing when you come in the doors? Yes, preacher. It only happens when your spirit's been revived. But that joyfulness is not in the... Oh, man, that choir was good, and they may be good. But our rejoicing is in the Lord. When He has done the work... And we've been able to set aside all that other foolishness and our attention and our focus is completely and totally upon Him and we can rejoice and rejoice fully because God has arrived. Oh, preacher. The only way that God could truly be glorified and praised in and through my life is if my life is on fire for Him. Now let me ask you, you can answer this now if you want to. Does the church of today need revival? I'm not talking about just our church. I'm talking about the church. Those who profess to be born again believers of Jesus Christ, do they need reviving? I can't answer for them. But I can tell you if the things in their life is like the things I've described today, yes, they need reviving. Do I need reviving? If I look at my life and it's nothing more than parched ground, dry and unfruitful, I know I need something. And the only something that can fix it is God. God will you once again. God will you once again give me a holy joy. A joy in knowing and understanding your word and your purpose and your plan for my life. 
God helping me to be more alive than I've ever been. God giving me a power that I can experience and know that you're at work in my life. Wouldn't it be a great joy to know that God did something in you and you know He did it and you can rejoice and give Him the glory for it? Yes, preacher. On our uh, fellowship, fellowship nights that we have once a month, it sure would be a blessing to hear about the fire that's burning. To learn about the things that God taught you from His Word this week that you never knew or experienced before. To demonstrate and explain and and tell us about how God's power moved upon you this week and you did something wonderful and amazing for Him. Oh, what a joyful time that would be. Wouldn't you like to have more joyfulness during your devotion time? Now listen, I'm not trying to mean being hey, but I told you, I'm in the same boat that you're in. I get just like this. Oh, no, not you, preacher. <clears throat> oh, God. Wilt thou not revive us again? Ask yourself. Do you, and when I say you, I'll include myself. Do you sense a need of such revival in you? Do you sense such a need for our church? Do you sense such a need for our schools? Do you sense such a need for our nation? If we know we need it, are we willing to do what God asks us to do? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. That dry and thirsty land, that land that's been parched through worldliness and unconcern and all the things that harden it, he said, I will revive it. I will bring freshness. I will make it new again. Do we truly long and desire for that? in our personal lives, in our church life, in our schools, and in our nation. Then who should we ask for? God. Will you not revive us again? And if he did, would we even cherish the experience? enough to rejoice in it. I'm going to ask you a couple hard questions. Others have been pretty easy. Can we ask, out ask God for anything? Can we ask too much for God to do? Can we outthink God? He said, this is what needs to take place in order to have revival. Can we outdream God? Can we outimagine God? And the answer is, no. So if we can't do it bigger and better and, and more than God, then guess who we need to go to? Him. Now the question before all of us today, are we willing to humble ourselves and come and cry out, God, I need revival. God, my life is dead, it's empty, it's fruitless, it's dry, it's barren. I don't sense your presence, I don't sense your power, I don't sense your joy, I don't sense your peace, I don't sense anything that you promised me to have. God, will you please 
revive us again. And I don't mean to overstate it, overstate it, but the very life of our church may depend upon what we do this day. Because without God, it will continue to dry. It will continue to get harder. It will continue to be robbed of joy. But I thank God that he will. In response to our earnest cry, will you not revive us? Will you not revive me? Will you not revive my family? Will you not revive our church, our nation? One more time. Every head bowed and every eye closed. It's been 16 months since I gave a come forward invitation. But today... We're going to do that. In just a minute, Bud and the ladies are going to come and they're going to lead us in our invitation hymn. It's probably catching them off guard because they've been used to doing it a different way. Dear friend, if any part of this message spoke to you, and you sense a need for spiritual renewing, a rekindling of the fire and the spirit. If you've come uh, slothful about the things of God or unexcited about things or all the stuff that we mentioned in the message, and you want him to do something about it, I'm going to ask you to come. And you can try to stay six feet apart if that's a uh, concern to you. But I'm going to ask you to come and kneel. Fall on your Facebook, if you can get down. If you can't, just sit down on the pew. But if you truly want a fresh new beginning with God, come today and ask Him. God, will you not revive me again that I might rejoice in Thee? Lord, we have tried to be faithful. What you laid on our heart for this day And God, I know that it's your heart's desire. Because I read the word and I see in the Old Testament every time that Israel went away from you, it was your desire for them to come back. But God, sometimes you had to send the chastening hand before they would come back. Sometimes you had to send a drought. Sometimes you had to send a thing. But eventually they saw that they needed to come back to you. God, may we have gotten to the place that we realize that there is no more. There is no more to go to other than you. And God, I pray that as we fall on our face before you and cry out, God, may you rekindle the fire in each one who truly longs and desires for it to be there for your honor and for your glory. And God, I, I come presenting myself to you. For God, you know, God, you know that often it gets dry, it gets unfruitful, and God, I need your revival, that I might have all the joy in you that I need, and be able to express it in a way that would bring honor and glory to you. And God, I'm begging, I'm pleading, I'm asking not just for me, but for this church, for each one in the church, and for our nation, for our schools. Oh God, we need you again. Would you please revive your work? God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.